We have prisons to keep real life villains at bay, but no system is unbreachable. And sometimes the nightmares slip through the cracks. Join us on our Jail Marathon, a compilation of some of the craziest prison escape stories ever. From intricate plans of escape to lucky twists of fate, these stories have all the ingredients to leave you speechless. Think some of these sound impossible? Guess again. Welcome to Jail. It was almost evening on May 31st, 1984, and all was not right at Mecklenburg Correctional Center in Virginia. Unbeknownst to the prison guards, an evil plan was just about to be put into motion by a rowdy gang of six inmates. Linwood and James Briley, Lim Tuggle, Earl Clanton, Derek Peterson, and Wiley Jones had all been sentenced to death, but they weren't going to sit around and wait for justice to be served. All six men were killers of vile reputations, but the worst of them were by far the Briley brothers, who seemed to rule over the entire death row. Back in 1979, Linwood and James Briley, their younger brother Anthony and an accomplice, Duncan Meekins, had been part of a ruthless seven-month killing spree in their hometown of Richmond, Virginia. Their killing spree took 11 lives that we know of and left many others in distress. The brothers and their accomplice were all arrested soon after committing the last murders. Duncan Meekins and Anthony Briley were given life sentences in prison because there was not enough proof that any of them had personally committed the murders. Linwood and James Briley were both sentenced to death. Evidence showed Linwood and James were both directly responsible for committing the murders. They were sent to death row in Mecklenburg Correctional Center in early 1980. By now, it was time to leave their past behind and start fresh, away from Mecklenburg. By all accounts, Linwood Bradley was the mastermind behind the escape plan. In 1984, at 30 years old, Linwood was charismatic, smart, and merciless. His brother James, who was 28, was far more placid and incapable of devising a complex plan. According to various descriptions, James had the face of a man who was born to die in the electric chair. He wasn't bright like Linwood, and he was cold. So it fell to Linwood to think things through, get the necessary resources for the escape, and gather up the other inmates. Finding people willing to break out of prison wasn't hard at all. After all, these men were sentenced to death. Even more, Linwood was popular and feared, which certainly helped convince the others. With Tuggle, Clanton, Peterson, and Jones now in tow, freedom was just around the corner. The men could probably almost taste it, and there was nothing, nothing that could hold them back. There had been some recent trouble some months ago. Several other inmates had alerted prison officials about the Briley's plan to break out of Mecklenburg. As a result, the prison officials instituted a general lockdown from April 1984 until the end of May, when bureaucrats and human rights watchers pressured the officials to put a stop to the lockdown. And now, it was time for the Briley's plan to become a reality. It was an evening on May 31st. Earl Clinton was the first one out of the six to act. As inmates were going back to the cell blocks for the night, Clanton slipped out of the line and into a bathroom adjacent to the control room. Then he proceeded to lock himself in the bathroom, unnoticed by any of the guards. A while later, at about 9 p.m., James Briley asked the guard in the control room if the man could retrieve a book for him in the locked day room. The guard left to retrieve the book, and that's when James Briley and Clanton attacked, overpowering the officer. After they took hold of the control room, James and Clanton started hitting buttons essentially unlocking the cells and opening doors. Mayhem ensued, but it was only the beginning. The Briley's had spent months, even years, studying the prison guards, their patterns, their behaviors, their protocols, even their personal gestures. This gave the prisoners a huge advantage. It meant they knew where to go, when to go, and how to proceed overall. With all the doors in the unit now unlocked and the feeling of insurgency in the air, the inmates easily overpowered the prison guards. The guards were stripped of their clothes, tied up, and forced in the cells. The six inmates changed into uniforms and started acting like guards. This was the next step of the prisoner's plan. They had to act like guards and radio officers in the areas of the prison. The reason was simple. They wanted to lure all officers to the building they now controlled. Each time a guard entered the unit, the convicts attacked them. They had weapons. The Briley's and their accomplices spent months turning lawn equipment into deadly devices. Each time a guard would show up to the building, James Briley and Lim Tuggle threatened them with makeshift blades. There were instances of mercy. The older Briley meant to sexually assault a prison nurse, but he was also stopped by another inmate. Officer Coraline Epps, who had just had a baby, also feared she was about to be raped and killed, but she too had an unlikely protector. Despite being one of the six inmates who had planned the entire escape, 
Earl Clanton came to Epps' defense, telling her quietly that he was a dad. I'm not going to let anyone come in here and hurt you. You have my word, Clanton told the woman. Then he proceeded to stay in front of the door, protecting her. As the minutes passed, the Brileys knew they were getting closer to their escape, but in order to reach the second portion of their plan, they needed the presence of one guard in particular. Then, they saw the man entering the building. One of the six inmates ambushed the officer, putting a blade to his throat. He had to listen and obey if he wanted to live. With the blade still pressed to his throat, the officer called other prison officials and told them the inmates had assembled a bomb and he needed to get it out of the prison before it detonated. He also asked for a prison van to be sent to the back of the unit so that the bomb could be carried away safely. Meanwhile, the Brileys and the other four inmates had to find something that could easily pass for a bomb. They raided a closet and put on riot gear. This way, their faces would be unseen by the prison guards they might encounter along the way. Then they placed a television on a gurney and covered it with a blanket. Their so-called bomb looked authentic enough. It was time to leave this hellhole, but not before getting fire extinguishers too. Just another touch of authenticity to their ruse. Linwood Briley, James Briley, Lynn Tuggle, Earl Clanton, Derek Peterson, and Willie Jones exited the building carrying the gurney. The van was waiting for them at the back of the building. Nobody even batted an eye at the six men. They looked the part of prison officials carrying a bomb. Then the men entered the van and away they went. The guard in charge of opening the prison's two sets of gates had her suspicions about the van, but in the end, she let the vehicle pass. And then, the six killers were out, free at last. They had $800 between the six of them because they had raided the pockets of each and every prison guard they'd come across. They had cigarettes and clothes and a strong intention of heading up north to Canada, a country that abhorred capital punishment and wouldn't have extradited anyone who would be sent back to a country to be executed. Eventually, the six inmates abandoned the van and split up. By then, the manhunt was already on. There was no bush, door creak, sound, or rumor left unchecked. Earl Clanton Jr. and Derek Peterson were caught first, the day after the breakout. Lim Tuggle Jr. and Willie Leroy Jones almost managed to get to Canada, but they too were soon captured by the police. The Bradley brothers were harder to catch, but in the end, they too were apprehended. They stuck together and might have even managed to escape, were it not for Lim Tuggle. Once he was caught, Tuggle told officers the Brileys were dropped off outside Philadelphia. Police knew the two brothers had family there. When a tap line on a Briley brothers acquaintance in New York showed a phone call from a Philadelphia garage, police knew they had the brothers in the bag. The Brileys were barbecuing chicken in the alley when they were arrested. None of the six inmates are alive today. They were all executed after being recaptured. Both Linwood and James Briley were executed in the electric chair at the Virginia State Penitentiary in Richmond. Linwood was executed in October 1984, while James was executed in April 1985. Earl Clanton's execution was carried out in April 1988. Derek Peterson's execution followed in August 1991. Willie Leroy Jones was executed in the electric chair in September 1992. The last of the six to die was Lim Tuggle, who chose lethal injection. He was executed on December 12, 1996. His final words were, Merry Christmas. It was April 25, 2011. Summer was close. But while for most Westerners, summer means nothing more or less than a great opportunity for vacation, there are people in this world with other priorities for the season. In the spring of 2011, the Taliban were getting ready for the upcoming fighting season in Afghanistan. The Taliban is an Islamic fundamentalist and militant movement in Afghanistan, which emerged in 1994 as a prominent faction in the Afghan Civil War. The group ruled almost the entire Afghanistan for five years, between 1996 and 2001, before being toppled by the United States and its allies. The Taliban recaptured Kabul, the country's capital, in 2021, and have since implemented their incredibly restrictive policies. In other words, they don't really believe in human rights, but no other country in the world believes in their government either. Before regaining control over Afghanistan, though, the Taliban fought hard and dirty for years. The Sarposa prison escape is just one example of their dangerous actions. With the fighting season so close, the Taliban needed reinforcements. And what better way to get fresh soldiers than to help hundreds of sympathizers escape prison? In April 2011, the Sarposa prison in Kandabar was housing some 500 Taliban, all held in the prison's political section. The highest profile Taliban inmates were held at a facility outside of Bagram Air Force Base in eastern Afghanistan, while other key prisoners were held by the Afghan government in a high security wing of the main prison in Kabul. Even though these men were generally considered a low-grade Taliban, 
they were still dangerous and more than eager to resume fighting for their cause. At that point, by April 25th, some of them had been serving for years, but the tide was turning. They could feel it, even though they had no official information from their superiors. But they knew that only a few weeks before, a Taliban suicide bomber had managed to blow up Kandabar's police chief. Another suicide bomber had come close to killing Afghanistan's defense chief, right in Kabul. All they had was their undying faith in their cause, but what they also had was a not so strict prison with guards that would smoke marijuana and heroin on a daily basis and then fall asleep without a worry in the world. Perhaps that's why many of the prisoners weren't too surprised by the events of early Monday morning, April 25th. There were only three or four people in the entire prison who knew what was about to go down. Months before, they'd managed to get copies of the prison keys. An important detail, they needed to make sure that they'd be able to open their cells. It was just before midnight when the plan was finally greenlit. The prison building was quiet, shrouded in darkness. Everyone was asleep. Well, almost everyone. The three men started waking up their fellow prisoners. They worked quietly, but efficiently. They knew they had to. Breaking almost 500 Taliban out of jail can't be easy work. They decided to wake up the prisoners in groups of four or five. This way, they figured, there wouldn't be that much racket. Not that the prison guards would necessarily react even if there was. There was another reason they needed to work with small groups only. The tunnel could get crowded and oxygen was limited. Yes, a tunnel. It had been five months in the making, but none of the Taliban inside the prison nor the Afghan officials knew anything about the tunnel. For months, a group of 18 insurgents from outside the prison had dug and burrowed thousands of feet underground. In order to avoid drawing suspicion on the huge mounds of brown soil, the insurgents sold truckloads of the earth in Kandabar's Bazaar. Everything about the escape had been thoroughly planned. So in order to keep things running smoothly, only a few people were woken up at a time. Each group walked quietly, room by room, until they reached a cell with a hole in the cement floor. The opening was about three feet in diameter. After a five foot drop, the prisoners had to walk some 1,180 feet in order to reach the other side, where the tunnel opened in a house. Sections of the tunnel were lit with electric lights. There were also fans, which ventilated the space. It wasn't an amateur creation. The Taliban had worked for five months in order to get it ready, and they had assistance from engineers. The tunnel led from the prison's political wing to a house southwest of the prison, which had been previously rented by the Taliban. In fact, the house had been searched by authorities only two months before the escape, maybe because of its close proximity with the prison, but authorities had somehow failed to find the entrance to the tunnel. Everything ran smoothly. Group after group went in the tunnel and came out on the other side. The guards were probably fast asleep, Nobody had any clue about what was happening inside the prison. Still, the Taliban were ready to retaliate if needed. They placed suicide bombers inside the house. Each of them was ready to fight and sacrifice themselves if it meant the others would escape. After reaching the house, the escapees were taken in vehicles to a safe place of the Taliban. Almost 500 Taliban were broken out of Sarposa prison. The whole operation took four and a half hours. At about four o'clock on Monday morning, a single prison guard wandered into the prison's political wing. But to his astonishment, the entire section was empty. 500 people were gone, but not without a trace. For some reason, the prisoners had left their clothes, shoes, and turbans behind. Authorities were alerted, and the investigation began. Mohammed Tahir, the head of the team investigating the escape, immediately thought that the escape had been aided by several prison guards. The Taliban were quick to claim the escape and even brag about it. They provided the details of the escape relishing in their success and their wit. Toyulai Wessa, the governor of Kandabar, publicly stated that security forces had failed in their duty. Wessa also said efforts were already underway to recapture the prisoners. Some of the escaped prisoners have been recaptured by security forces during searching operations, and huge operations have launched inside and on the outskirts of Kandabar city for the rest of them, he said. The shame of this escape was made even more bitter by the fact that it wasn't the first of its kind. Three years prior, in June 2008, the Taliban had managed to break out 870 inmates from the same prison. That time around, they had used a suicide bomber to break a hole in the prison in order to free the prisoners. This is a blow, presidential spokesman Wahid Omar said after the prison escape. A prison break of this magnitude of course points to a vulnerability. The magnitude of the event was even greater considering it had all happened under the noses of Afghan and NATO officials. To make matters worse, the Taliban said they had freed more than 500 of their fellow insurgents and that about 100 of them were commanders. 
Four of them were former provincial chiefs. The security around the prison was enhanced after the escape. The Afghan Uniform Police also established a checkpoint directly across the highway from the prison, directly above the tunnel exit. But the escape was a big blow to the Afghan authorities, with suspicions about government officials and their inability to protect civilians skyrocketing. At least 71 of the escaped prisoners were allegedly recaptured, though the numbers aren't exactly confirmed. As of 2021, the Taliban are once again ruling over Afghanistan. They swore to bring about a truly Islamic state, and they also expressed their desire to have good relations with the United States. But their idea of an Islamic state and good relations with the rest of the world doesn't necessarily seem to involve the pledge to protect human rights. Back in 2018, Faid staged a spectacular escape, a tour de force which baffled authorities and turned Faid into somewhat of a gangster superstar. It was a Sunday morning in July 2018. While some attended Sunday service, others, namely Red One Faid, were getting ready for a show-stopping prison escape. Faid wasn't a mere petty criminal. He was somebody in the world of crime, a seasoned gangster who took pride in his so-called craft. At 45 years old, the man has spent his entire life involved in some type of illegal activities. Red One Faid was born in 1972 in France to Algerian immigrant parents. He didn't have an easy childhood. In 1988, his father abandoned his family and left Faid's mother to care for 11 children. Three years later, Faid's mother died of cancer. Red One Faid had always loved cinema, particularly gangster movies. When he was a child, awe-filled by the action-packed thrillers he would watch, Faid swore he would either become a policeman or a thief. At only 19, he was already a delinquent and so were his brothers. They all worked together toward a life of crime. Red One Faid's first big robbery took place in 1990, when he was still a senior in high school. After robbing a bank, he switched to hijacking and robbing armored vans. At that point, he didn't have big plans for the stolen money. Instead, he used the money to impress his friends. Faid wanted to look like he was used to leading a flamboyant life. He wanted to be one of the smooth gangsters he adored when he was a child. In the mid-90s, the man led a criminal gang responsible from everything from armed robbery to jewel theft and extortion. After spending three years on the run, Red One Faid was arrested in 1998 and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was released on parole only 10 years later. Once he was released, Faid wrote a book about his experiences, claiming he was a changed man. Two years later, in 2011, Faid was back in prison, this time with the nickname Levrikan, the writer. But Faid didn't entirely agree with his new eight-year sentence. Sure, he was in fact guilty of planning an armed robbery that had claimed the life of a policewoman, but this didn't mean he had to suffer too, right? That's why, in 2013, he used explosives to blast through five prison doors, while also taking hostages with him. Faid fled the prison using a getaway car, but authorities caught up with him six weeks later. And this time around, they weren't going to let him escape. Or so they thought. On July 1, 2018, Red One Faid was serving his new sentence in the Sud Francilian prison in Rayu, in the Paris region. The stunt he'd pulled back in 2013 by breaking out of jail had gotten him 10 years imprisonment. 18 more years had been added to his sentence for masterminding the 2010 armed robbery in which a young policewoman was killed. This time around, nobody believed Faid had another jailbreak in him. They were wrong. Over the years, Faid had become well-liked in prison. He was always polite to his guards and fellow inmates. He always had that old-time gangster aura about him, but sometimes the quiet ones are the most dangerous. It was an early Sunday. It was also visiting day in the Sud Francilian prison in Rayu. 45-year-old Red One Faid walked quietly into the visitor's room. One of his brothers, Brahim, was there, waiting to have a little chat with Faid. Everything seemed normal. There was no sign of foul play. Despite this, prison officials were paying close attention to Faid. For some months, there had been several sightings of drones flying over the prison. Authorities immediately had to wonder whether there was a connection between the drones and Faid. For months, officials requested that Faid be transferred to another facility. But by the 1st of July, 2018, the man was still in the same prison, which left guards fearing for their safety. Once he got in the visitor's room, Red One Faid made himself comfortable and started talking to his brother. He knew attracting the guards' attention in any way would put a big dent in his plans. He had to appear unbothered, relaxed. In reality, he was probably more than excited. 
his body tingling in anticipation. He loved planning moments like this. In fact, he thought of himself as a bit of a filmmaker. Only he wasn't making up a story for the screen. He was altering real life, freezing time, and anticipating any problem that might interrupt his art form. While he talked to his brother Rahim, three other men were carrying out the master plan to help Faid break out of prison. Earlier that morning, Stephanie Bai, a helicopter pilot who had been hired by some tourists to give a ride over the countryside outside of Paris, found himself in a dire predicament. He found himself at the mercy of two gunmen. The gunmen ordered him to obey their instructions, otherwise, they said, Bai's family would be in great danger. To make sure the pilot would cooperate, the gunman told him there was a commando stationed just outside his home, just waiting for the signal to hurt the man's partner and his daughter. The 65-year-old pilot gulped for air. He knew he had no choice but to follow the men's orders. The helicopter took off. Shortly after, it made a quick stop in a field. A third man boarded the helicopter, but not before the gunman loaded what sounded like weapons and other equipment. Once again, the helicopter took off, heading towards Rayu. One of the gunmen told the pilot to land in a triangular courtyard near the prison's main entrance. The prison courtyard was the only area not protected by anti-aircraft netting, mostly because prisoners would use it only to enter and exit the prison. As the helicopter made its descent into the prison courtyard, guards were confused. No one was sure what was happening, not even the prison's central command. In hindsight, nobody believed anyone would be crazy enough to try to pull this kind of stunt. In hindsight, they were wrong. But then, something happened. Two armed men wearing black ski masks, paramilitary combat gear, and ski goggles to protect their eyes jumped out of the helicopter and into the courtyard. The men threw smoke bombs and tear gas canisters at all the surrounding buildings. Meanwhile, the third man remained inside the helicopter, his gun pointed promptly at the pilot's head. He ordered the pilot to hover the helicopter above the courtyard. Then, they waited. Meanwhile, the two other gunmen used a power saw to open the door leading into the prison building. They both had rifles and were ready to use them at any time. In a matter of minutes, one of the men entered the visitor's room. Faid followed him. Together, the two men made their way out of the prison building. Nobody dared to prevent them from leaving the building. In fact, nobody was there, not even one guard. Once Faid got to the helicopter, he knew he had to do one last movie-like gesture. He turned toward the prison and saw two people, a guard and an inmate, watching him from behind a window. Smiling like one of his beloved old-time gangsters, Faid put his right hand to his temple into a mocking Air Force salute. Then, he was gone. A massive manhunt ensued involving more than 3,000 French police officers. Red One Faid spent three months on the run before he was eventually caught. He was arrested on Wednesday, October 3, 2018, at around 4 a.m. local time. Perhaps his sentimentality was what gave him away. French special forces found Faid in an apartment located in Cray, a city in the northern suburbs of Paris and Faid's birthplace. After he was finally caught, Red One Faid was immediately taken to one of France's most secure prisons and placed in solitary confinement. Faid still won, in a sense. His devotion to becoming a movie-like gangster was rewarded in 2018, shortly after he was arrested. French director Pierre Morel, best known for directing Taken, revealed his intention to direct a Red One Faid biopic. On March 25, 1999, John Killick was waiting in Silverwater's jail exercise yard. Killick knew what was coming, or more exactly, who was coming. At 57 years old, Killick was still very young at heart, and he was head over heels in love with an unusual woman a 41-year-old librarian named Lucy Dudko. There was only one reason Killick was waiting in the exercise yard. Lucy was coming to rescue him. The couple had hatched a plan to get Killick out, and March 25th was the big day. Killick and Dudko met sometime in the mid-90s while at a party. The two of them fell hard for each other, despite their apparent differences. Dudko, who had a thick accent, was a Russian-Australian librarian. She had a slight frame and a kind face. Nothing about her appearance pointed to her inner strength, her resourcefulness, and dubious morals. As for Killick, he was a career criminal. Killick's childhood had been a comfortable one, but it all changed when he turned 17 years old and his mother committed suicide. That very day, Killick decided to leave home and make his own luck. Seven months later, he was in juvie. The first experience didn't determine Killick to seek out a more righteous lifestyle. 
1966, the man started his long career as a bank robber. He needed the easy money to fund his gambling addiction. As such, he acquired quite the reputation, becoming Australia's first decimal currency bank robber. Not even meeting Lucy Dudko was enough to get the man to settle down for long. In fact, maybe that was part of the attraction. While Killick was definitely a skilled robber and a dangerous man, he was widely regarded as a gentleman. He had never physically hurt anyone. Once Killick and Dudko met, they embarked on an affair before moving to Canberra. Soon after, police came knocking. Years before, Killick had violated parole there and authorities wanted him back in jail for it. It didn't matter what the authorities wanted. Killick and Dedko were together. They were in love, and nothing was going to tear them apart. The couple took off, leaving everything else behind. To make a living, John Killick began doing what he knew best, robbing banks. But the man's luck ran out, and he was arrested and imprisoned in Silverwater Jail in Sydney. Killick and Dedko's romance didn't fade away. They stayed together through thick or thin. At one point, while Killick was appearing at a courthouse hearing in Queen Bean in southeast New South Wales, Dudko suggested she could break him out of custody. She had a gun, and she was ready to break all hell loose in order to help her beloved. But John Killick told Lucy Dudko to abandon the plan. It was too risky. Instead, the two of them hatched a better plan. They had plenty of time. Dudko would visit Killick three times a week at his prison. That's when they came up with the idea to use a helicopter. Silverwater Jail was the perfect ground, both literally and figuratively, for an escape by helicopter. Some believe the prison guards may be too easily used as an airplane landing pad when Silverwater was first erected and later rebuilt for about $84 million. The prison's perimeter was once patrolled by armed guards, but they were retired in 1995 and replaced with security cameras. Security cameras, as you might have guessed, aren't able to shoot any would-be escapees. As Killick waited in the exercise yard, Lucy Dedko was carrying out her plan. She was determined to free her boyfriend, no matter the cost. On the morning of March 25, 1999, Lucy booked a helicopter joyride. The pilot, Tim Joyce, was to take her over the so-called Harbor Bridge track, which included the Olympic Stadium and Village, Sydney Harbor, and Manly. There was nothing out of the ordinary about Dudko's request. With the Sydney Olympics only a year away, many tourists booked flights near the site. What was unusual about Dudko, the pilot noticed, was she had four shopping bags with her. Still, the woman seemed harmless enough. The helicopter took off, and Tim Joyce, the pilot, started his usual routine. He began offering tidbits of educational commentary about the track. He attempted small talk and small remarks about the sights. But his passenger, Lucy Dedko, was far from interested in what the man had to say. Instead, she was fussing, agitated, and looking for something inside her shopping bags. As they neared the Olympic site, Dedko's interest was piqued. Was that a prison just ahead, she asked the man. Then, Dudko asked Joyce to fly around the prison. She wanted to get a better look. Joyce flew around the prison's perimeter. Dudko kept looking for something in her bags. And then, she finally found what she was looking for. The woman got out a two-shot Derringer pistol. She pointed it at the pilot's head. This is a hijack, she told him. Joyce immediately tried to activate the transponder, but he was out of luck. Lucy Dudko knew what a transponder was. John Killick's cellmate was a con man helicopter pilot and he told Killick all about the transponder and what it did. If the pilot had gotten the chance to activate it, the device would have created a frequency at Sydney Control Flight Services, alerting them of a hijack. Dudko was well informed. In an instant, she hit the pilot's hand with the handle of her gun. She then turned off the transponder as well as the radio switch. Dudko instructed the pilot to land in the prison exercise area. The man had no other choice. It was either that or death. John Killick watched the helicopter approaching the yard. He was proud. Dudko was indeed a feisty woman. Other prisoners around him watched in awe, either too stunned to move or cheering. Then, most of them ran toward the prison building. Killick made his way toward the helicopter. Once John Gillick got inside the chopper, he was the one to direct the pilot. Killick told Joyce to fly northeast to Macquarie University, about six miles away in Sydney's north, and land on Christine's Oval. Once they landed, Killick tied Joyce's arms and legs with a cord and told him to stay still for a while. Then, Killick and Dudko ran into a nearby bush. They watched Joyce untie himself and go into a nearby clubhouse, where he called the police. The couple then flagged down a car and, holding the driver at gunpoint, made their way to North Sydney, where they met up with some of Killick's old friends. Then, their trace was lost. 
The news of the prison escape took Sydney by storm. Calls from people claiming to have seen the couple were flooding in daily. Authorities quickly realized Lucy Dedko was the number one suspect in the case. Media loved the story. It was a classic tale of gun-toting lovers, them against the world. The press dubbed Dudko as Red Lucy. The couple were named Australia's Most Wanted. The investigation took officers to Killick's ex-wife, Gloria's apartment. Apparently, Lucy Dudko and Gloria had struck up a friendship, and Lucy had been living in Gloria's apartment since Killick had been in prison. That's where the police discovered pages torn from flight magazines advertising helicopter joyrides over Sydney and three videos, hostage, breakout, and fled. Dudko had certainly done her homework. It took authorities 45 days to catch John Gillick and Lucy Dudko. On May 8th, the two checked into Bays Hill Caravan Park in Sydney's West, renting a cabin under a false name. Apart from the false name, they'd done little else to disguise themselves. The two had only dyed their hair. Their cover was blown by the caravan park manager. Minutes later, their cabin was surrounded by police officers who used loud hailers to let the couple know their adventure was over. Dudko was convicted on five charges. She received a 10-year sentence. Killick was given a 23-year prison sentence. Their love story refused to die. For years, the couple exchanged more than 4,000 letters and 100 phone calls. They repeatedly made requests for permission to marry, but all of them were refused. Dudko was the one to call off the relationship. While in prison, she embraced religion and decided to move on with her life without Killick. Lucy Dedko was released seven years and two months after the escape. John Killick eventually got out of prison, on parole, and is now an author with three published books.